pilot's panel. Not yet. Okay. You need to pick up the okay. mic like this. Quino, that look that sounded good too. Where I think we're okay. It wasn't loud enough. How about this? That's a little too loud. Okay. How about this? <laughs> All right, we may play with it a little bit. God, that who, who is that person? He's aging. Ah, I have no idea who that is. All right. By the way, while we're waiting, I want to mention something you had mentioned again. The exhibitor room, the developing, and the building up the brother and those people is an unbelievable number of books out there. Uh, you can, uh, you got almost anything you want. Good opportunity. Also, the room across from the registration area is, in fact, set up for you all. It's, it's, a, it's a combination art gallery and lounge, so you can have some place to go and relax. And a number of artists, uh, DJ Bachman, uh, Betty Plummer, Dr. Julie Walker, and um, Yancey, uh, oh, his name is Yancey, Yancey, I've forgotten it, but it's, it's on his sculpture. Uh, I've got some things in there, it's really cool. I actually had some other artists that might contribute. I, I, I wanted to pursue this, including space art. We may see more of this in the future, but that room is for you to go in and relax and what have you, so feel, feel free to use it. And again, I'll mention that we're down to maybe six banquet tickets. So, so we're going to do something pretty quick there. 198 is the cap for the room. And uh, you have a choice of salmon, chicken, strict kosher, or vegetarian. And I predicted exactly how many would pick each of those. And they're watching that carefully. If I get it right, they're going to copy some sort of a room or something. Create them out of the ether. I have no writers. Can't afford them. I invent this stuff as I go. Believe me, I couldn't possibly. I can't tell a joke. You know, one of those, you know, farmer meets a guy down at the gas station, takes him. I can't tell that joke. Never tell that joke. Just give me a couple of glasses of wine and just, you know, spin me around. Just let me go. I tell you, wild stuff comes out. Unfortunately, you can't make a living that way. They can't, they can't take you out on the, the, the Letterman stage and give you two glasses of wine and spin you around. It, it doesn't work. Right? Contemporaneous humor doesn't work. You have to be skilled. Are we close, Ted? Yeah, we're rolling. We are? You're getting my shtick on this tape? <laughs> well, actually, that's what I want. Uh, Just go ahead. Okay. All right. This is, yeah, they're calling, all right, you betcha. Actually, I did get a call from John Daly show to be on the show during my campaign for Congress in 2002. And I kind of turned it down because I hadn't been watching it. I didn't realize it was about to become one of the most popular shows in all of history. So uh, I'm waiting for them to call back. They haven't. I love that show. I live for that show, The Daily Show. It's the only connection you got to reality. Find it, watch it. It's your only hope. There you go. Yeah. It was already on, so it should be into. Yeah. And I have to put a CD in it, right? Uh, not sure yet. We'll figure that out. Ah, okay. <laughs> CD, salami sandwich, whatever works. I'm setting a light tone, but this is not a light. Uh, Presentation, trust me. It is it. <clears throat> this, um, this may be the first pilot's panel of its type that I know of. It's possible there's been another, but I don't think so. If there has been, one of these fellows is going to tell me that, all right? Uh, and the reason is simple. As I pointed out to you earlier, and I won't you know, reiterate all of that, uh, but faced with the rather interesting dilemma of some of the most skilled people in the service of the country and in the civilian world, right? I mean, who have you gotten on an airplane, maybe particularly back in the 60s, one of those kind of, you know, big with the multiple engine thingies, and got on there and thinking, you know, while you're eating some, some, uh, some uh, rather 
poor food. Man, I hope the pilot up there is completely incompetent. You know, God, I hope he doesn't know what he's doing. Or she. Well, there weren't any she's back then, right? No she pilots. Uh, you don't do that. In fact, you sat there and you were thinking, silver hair and uh, strong jaw, uh, a presence, a charisma, a style. Uh, you know, sort of a John Forsyth kind of guy capable of utter cool no matter what the situation. You wanted that person and you want him in that cockpit. Okay, so when the pilot started reporting, the government did what it had to do. It shut him up. All right? So now you have a situation where you have the government going to people who are not only uh, called or, or, or asked to, to protect the nation at the highest level, Remember fail-safe? Okay. But also those that are flying hundreds of thousands of civilians around uh, and landing them safely. And they had to shut them up. So when people talk to me about, gee, you know, yeah, the cover-up's not such a bad thing. And there's some ups and some downs. I say, look, you start shutting up some of the best people you got, you don't have a good thing. You never have a good thing when you got that. The Soviet Union played that game. They shut up anybody that was good. And finally, the whole thing just collapsed in a heap. So this is not a good sign. So I was paying attention to that very early. And one of the things I learned early on was that a gentleman by the name of Dr. Richard Haynes, who worked for NASA up until recently, I believe, started collecting pilot sightings until he had 3,000 of them. All right. And that became, in my opinion, the most powerful piece of evidence in the world on this issue, period. Richard was kind of constrained with what he could do or not do, given his circumstances. And so he did some things, went in different directions. He got the issue out there. Eventually, it metamorphosed into, uh, metamorphosed into uh, NARCAP, which is essentially an entity dealing with aviation safety. And it no longer wants to be associated with this issue. I I don't want to pass judgment there. Nevertheless, that pilot database still exists. Richard Haynes has kind of stepped back. He's not involved. Why? I don't know. All right? That's just the pilots that came to him. And the reason they went to him is because the government wouldn't let them talk if they were military, and the civilian companies wouldn't let them talk because uh, it would, quote, damage the company. And so they started going elsewhere to tell their stories, and he started collecting them. He also did some surveys, 3,500, maybe 5,000. I've heard numbers as high as 5,000. And so I'm thinking, OK, we have this piece of evidence, and we have pilots flying all over the place. They know a lot. And, and so what I wanted to do was to bring five together, right, to talk about themselves, to answer some tough questions, and get this issue in play, get it on film, in hopes of bringing more pilots out. There are pilots that are out besides these gentlemen. There are a number of them. I've seen them recently. In fact, there were at least four on the Jennings show which are not on the stage tonight, and I didn't even know who they were. Who knows? One day we may have a 50 pilots panel. All right? So this is why we're doing it, and now we're going to start. And what I want to do is I'll start at the far end and allow each person to give you a quick description of what got, got them here today. Right? And a little bit about their flight career. All right? And do we have a mic we can pass down to Commander Bethune? OK. First uh, to speak will be Commander Graham Bethune, uh, who is considered a witness in the disclosure process. Graham. OK, can you hear me? Yeah. I'll probably have to lay this mic down, because when I get into some of the maneuvers that we went through, I have to lay it down. <laughs> The reason that I talk about this encounter is one of the earlier ones. I was a Navy transport plane commander stationed at the Naval Air Test Center in Packed River, which is not too far from here, about 60 miles. And it was a big meeting in Washington, D.C. at a high level. Eisenhower was at the meeting. He was a NATO commander at the time. And I was one of two that was sent to Iceland to work out the necessary arrangements to fly troops to Iceland to protect them. And so what happened is that at the meeting that we had between the Icelandic government and Lockheed overseas, they were talking about things that we were not aware of. And at the end of this meeting, I asked the fellow from Lockheed overseas, what were they seeing? 
So he started explaining these craft. They were round, which said, it's a test center in Pax River. We knew everything on the board, but we had nothing like that. Didn't make any noise, the speed, and were monsters. So I said, well, <coughs> we don't know of anything of that nature. What did our government tell you they were? He said, well, your government said they were possibly experimental Russian bombers. And of course, we laughed about that. So to, to speed this up a little bit, after this meeting, they flew in to pick us up. The crew that came in had been in the air for 18 hours, so it was decided that I would fly the plane from Keflavik, Iceland, to Archangel, Newfoundland. We we're flying at 10,000 feet, and part of the weather report always in that part of the country is the northern lights. There was no northern lights activity. It was night. The moon had been down for about an hour and a half. And about 300 miles outside of um, Argentia, I saw like a city on the water at a distance. Of course, you couldn't see the lights and you didn't find the lights. About 45 miles away. As we got closer, those lights became a pattern, it was a circle pattern, a large circle pattern. There were no ship plots, nothing in the area that we knew of, so we thought maybe the Navy is doing something secret, recovering something. So as we got closer to this, about, uh, I guess, 20, 25 miles away, these defined lights disappeared. There was nothing on the water. So naturally, the navigator and everybody behind me were up behind me, and I could see heads. And, and just a, a minute or two, there was a yellow halo on the water. Now, we're at 10,000 feet, and that yellow halo came from the water or from this craft that was sitting on the water and we were about 15 miles away at that time just like this a fraction of a second i disengaged the autopilot to go underneath this and when i did i heard a noise and i couldn't figure out what it was i asked the co-pilot actually who was the plane commander what was that and he said well the navigator and the radio man collided ducking and and then the navigator heard his head on the table and radio heard and they were scrambling on the deck. So at that time, I'm focusing still on the, on the craft and I didn't see it any longer. And the, uh, Fred King says it's over on the right. I couldn't see it. So I went to, to reset the autopilot. What I did, the magnetic compass was swinging back and forth. And the bird dogs, we call them, were pointing to that craft and we had some other problems. So I had to set our, our course with a vacuum operating uh, uh, directional gyro. At this time, the other crews, it was time for them to come forward. They wouldn't land at our judge So we sent a crew back to bring them forward. Al Jones, the other plane commander, took my seat, and I went aft <coughs> to see how the passengers were doing. We had 31 passengers. We had a doctor that was a psychiatrist out of Bethesda Naval Hospital. And so I decided to talk to him first. All the passengers were on the right-hand side. And so I asked him, did he see what we saw? He says, yes, it was a flying saucer. <clears throat> he said, I didn't look at it because I don't believe in such things. So <laughs> that, that was our first clue. I went back to the cockpit and said, whatever you do, don't let anybody know we saw anything or it'll lock us up when we get on the ground. So they said it was too late to call Ganner Control to see if it was could, they could track it by radar. The reply was what was a little bit disturbing. They came back and said that you were the only aircraft in the area. They usually say traffic in the area. So we knew we were in for trouble when we landed. So when we landed at Argentia, we were interrogated by the Air Force. Now we had to wait for them to arrive because they had tracked this by radar. So they don't usually investigate anything unless they had tracked it by radar. So we had it tracked by radar. We had a psychiatrist on board. 31 passengers, and we had quite a few uh, pilots that flew the North Atlantic. So then after they interrogated us, they made their report. Then when we got back to the Patuxent River, we made a report to, to Navy Intelligence, each one individual. So this report, of course, went to the group that sent us to, to Iceland. And as far as we know, I'll try to complete this. As far as we know, it's the only case on record where our country has sent troops to another country to protect them from flying saucers. 
So that's basically my story. Okay, Grant, thank you. And of course that led him to play, actually many decades now of research, because he is a researcher. He looks into these issues, uh, as, as many others here at the speaking to. Now, uh, next up, uh, Robert Durant. And if you, if you can say who you flew for and what your rank was, uh, yeah, feel free. I, I, I can, and I think some of my colleagues might uh, not want to. They're still active. I flew for the late, great Pan Am for 23 years until it went bankrupt and out of business, and then I was very lucky and got hired by Delta and flew the last eight years of my career with them, and now they can't touch me because I'm totally retired. But uh, my perspective is uh, perhaps a little bit different from that of my colleagues here. Um, the reason being, I'm not here to report a personal UFO sighting while flying. I've never had one while flying. But for two and a half years, I actually flew a desk at Pan Am. I was uh, the equivalent of a chief pilot, a flight operations manager. And I had my own office and a secretary and stuff like that. And Mainly what I did was things that uh, you would never dream needed to be done, but pilots are people, okay? So there's alcohol problems, and there's guys whose uh, uh, marital problems bleed over into the workplace and uh, aggression, and uh, I can tell you there's been uh, fist fights in the cockpit, okay? That's not good, and somebody not needs good. to put those fires out and do something about it. Um, Usually, uh, being a father confessor and psychiatrist and stuff like that works. Plus, as Mark Twain used to say, a kind word and a gun is better than a kind word. And uh, Pan Am gave me a gun and I had to fire two people, uh, which I did. But uh, my, my operating rule was basically, number one, keep it out of the newspapers, okay? Number two, keep it away from the Federal Aviation Administration. And if I managed to do all of that, then I was uh, earning my, my keep as a flight operations manager for a major airline. I'm not gonna give you the rest of the details. Um, one day, a fellow walked in my office, and it, it was somebody that I knew, and he said, Bob, gotta talk to you. Something really serious happened when we flew over to Paris the other day. And I'm thinking right away, keep it out of the papers, keep it away from the FAA, keep it out of the papers. And he says, we saw a UFO. And I thought, oh boy. And what had happened was, in very clear air, excellent visibility, the best of circumstances, all three crew members on that 747 had seen an egg-shaped object, white, slightly glowing, and it flew around in front of them and then eventually flew over the airplane. They got a very good look at it. They called it into air traffic control, which said, uh, we've got nothing on radar, but you're pretty far out now. Uh, we don't have any help for you. The rest of the way, this was a departure out of Kennedy to Paris. According to the captain, the rest of the flight, when they had a chance, they debated, do we tell anybody else about what happened and what we saw? And then they laid over in Paris and apparently most of the way back to Kennedy. The day after, they still had that debate and finally decided that since two out of the three pilots knew me personally and they thought I was a straight shooter, that they would report it to the company. Now. Uh, I got the report, I made notes. Uh, I'm sorry to say I didn't pass it on to anybody like MUFON because the pilots were not afraid of the UFO. They were afraid of being trashed and demeaned by the press, mainly. That's what they were afraid of and why they didn't want to go further and they didn't want Pan Am's management to demean them and trash them. And that's why they finally came to me with some pre trepidation. So my part of the uh, bargain for uh, working as a manager for Pan Am was, was satisfied. They weren't gonna talk to the uh, newspapers and there was no need really to pass it on to the FAA case closed, fine. Now I wanna fast forward about 10 years. Uh, 
and I saw a little newspaper report, an AP wire report about half an inch, that a Swiss air crew had reported a UFO and in the same breath, it turned out to be a weather balloon. Well, weather balloons somehow, since I've been involved with UFO research for almost 50 years now, and I'm, I'm not bragging, I'm complaining, trust me, but when I hear weather, weather balloon, uh, it, something goes like this inside. And so I said, I, I gotta talk to that crew. Just maybe, it took me six months and it turned out that I had to go through three layers of protection that had been built up around that Swiss Air crew. They didn't release that story. It was the FAA that did a preemptive strike because the FAA was afraid somebody else would release their story, so they hit it with the explanation at the same time as the story. That's a good trick. I had to go through our pilots union here in America and call in a lot of IOUs so that they would go to the European Pilots Union and all the time convincing a long series of people that I'm a researcher, not a journalist. I hope there's some journalists in this room listening to what I have to say, okay? Finally, I went, uh, I got a phone call, but it took six months and it was a phone call from the captain who said, I'm gonna be laying over in Boston pretty soon. He gave me the details, the co-pilot never to this day has spoken to anyone outside of Swiss Air, actually. And to some federal officials here. And what happened was they were at 23,000 feet. An object appeared in front of them. It was cylindrical, white. This is uh, in, in about one o'clock in the afternoon, very clear air. Then flew right over them, over the right wing, maybe clearing the airplane by about 50 feet. Now, once again, what we have is uh, obviously a, uh, a structured object. Couldn't have been a balloon, I won't tell you why. We wrote a big, thick report on it, which is available from the Fund for UFO Research or CUFOs. But when they landed and they called it in, they were met by the FBI and the FAA, and the National Transportation Safety Board. The reason, I suspect, was not because any of those people thought it was a UFO, but this took place about nine months after TWA 800. And as all of us good citizens know, TWA 800 was caused by the spontaneous explosion of the center fuel tank. <laughs> However, as just about everybody in the aviation community knows, rot's a ruck, and when somebody's reporting a cylindrical shaped thing, even though it had no markings on it, no fins, no nothing, uh, that's what got the FBI and everybody else onto that case, I think. The commonalities is what I wanna leave you with. What we've done by allowing this climate of ridicule is we have robbed society and we have robbed science of this extraordinarily rich source of UFO reports. And there's a zillion of them out there, as Steve said. And as long as journalism continues to trash these uh, UFO stories, professionals like airline pilots who don't exactly live and die by their reputations, but who are terribly sensitive to them, as I think we may hear shortly, uh, are not gonna make those reports. So Steve, uh, that's it from me. Thanks, Bob, appreciate it. Robert has been a researcher for many decades, and he's an, an expert on Roswell. Uh, so if you, if you wanna talk about Roswell, he's a good man to talk with. Next up, I'd like to uh, present to you uh, pilot David Coop. Thanks, Steve. Uh, I first met Steve last year, this time last year. Um, we spent some uh, rather intimate time together until about four or five in the morning stuffing registration envelopes. And uh, thanks, Steve. I, I didn't have to endure that today. Uh, yeah, appreciate spared that. you. It's the least I could do. <laughs> and when he asked me to be on the panel, I really thought, what could I contribute? Um, yes, I'm a pilot, but uh, contrary to possibly popular belief, pilots aren't anything special, but don't tell anybody that. I. Uh, 
I fly with them all the time. What got me interested in this is um, I think uh, everybody tends to believe what they're told until they have a reason to, to not believe it. And that reason for me started in um, October 92. Actually, it started prior to that, but the, the main event was uh, 92. I found myself in Hong Kong with a rucksack on my back, ready to, to go through the back door into an undisclosed country. And uh, I was going to bring out some blood samples for, for DNA fingerprinting and some uh, fingerprints and some videotape evidence. It was uh, phase one of a, an operation we hoped to, to accomplish to bring out some alive Americans that have been in captivity in Southeast Asia since the Vietnam War. Uh, long story short, uh, what happened was uh, the individual I was communicating with was shot and killed. And uh, after the mission, or the operation was scrapped, I flew back to New Zealand. And uh, shortly after that, another couple of guys I'd been working with in Hong Kong had to hightail it into uh, Thailand to cool their heels for a couple of months. What I'm trying to uh, bring out here is the fact that this occurred 20 years or so after we'd been told officially by our government that there are no more live American prisoners in Southeast Asia. Having been in the military for seven years, the first time I heard that um, before, prior to 92, I thought it was just a rumor. I thought it was just rubbish. Then I get out and I fly helicopters based on oil rigs in the Gulf of Mexico. And I'm flying with some gentlemen who had been in Air America. And I'm not sure if there's anybody here unfamiliar with Air America, but they were an offshoot uh, or an airline of, of the CIA in Southeast Asia. And they also brought up the same topic of live Americans still in captivity. And uh, once again, I thought, well, I've heard the story before, but I'm still not convinced. And then in 92, uh, I was called uh, that I must fly to America now because there are some men with some evidence um, regarding live Americans in Southeast Asia. And I, I didn't know what to do with it because I'd already taken some, some information to the CIA regarding these people. And uh, I really didn't go any further than have myself investigated. So um, I said, well, hang on, wait a minute. And I made a phone call and I got in touch with Ross Perot. And it was during the 92 campaign, uh, election campaign. And I said, you don't know me. Um, can I talk to Ross Perot? And I said, okay, whatever. I said, well, I understand. I said, here's a phone number. I've just been called. There are a couple of gentlemen on the west coast of the United States with some information um, regarding live Americans in captivity. If he's interested, tell him to call me. Well, it was a short time after that. Uh, I was laying in bed without my pajamas on at about 2 o'clock in the morning. And I uh, get a phone call. And I answered, and it's stand by for Ross Perot. So it's like, OK. And uh, what do you got, he says. And um, I said, well, you don't really know me, sir, but here's the deal. I have some information. Um, I don't know if you're the right man to talk to, but uh, I understand you were sympathetic to the POW cause during the Vietnam War. And uh, can they come and see you? Because I don't know what to do with them. He says, all right, tell them to bring some, uh, some flowers and uh, stand in a certain place. I have my men, my boys go pick them up. So long story short, he got involved. He called me um, and said, here's a deal. You have to um, bring me the evidence first before I will do anything. But then he said, you can have anything you want. And uh, so I sold up my photography gear and I, and I hopped over there. What I'm trying to say is that this got me started on a, a quest, if you like, for the truth. And uh, amongst this, this, uh, this quest, I stumbled upon many things. Uh, probably many things you already know, you're familiar with Hegelian philosophy of thesis, antithesis, synthesis, problem, reaction, solution, um, social engineering, federal bank, uh, federal reserve scams, IRS scams, you name it, the list goes on and on, secret societies, uh, the occult, etc. Um, so the UFO thing kind of interested me because I'd been involved in the POW cause, I came upon a gentleman um, by the name of Colonel Philip J. Corso. I don't know him personally, but he had testified at some, uh, some hearings, subcommittee hearings on uh, National Security Committee uh, House hearings on POW accountability. And he brought out that after World War II and, and Korea, Korean War, we had left many people behind. We knew about them, we abandoned them. And uh, so because of this, when the book comes out the day after Roswell, um, I was quite uh, surprised to find it was the same author, so I thought I'd better read that. And, and he very ma matter of fact, he brings out the, the, the fact that 
Yes. Um, we retrieved these vehicles. We got technology, night vision technology, which I utilized later on in the military when I was flying helicopters. Uh, laser technology, the integrated circuit chip, etc. So that, that drove me to investigate uh, further. And, and it's, a, it's a small world, these, these links, uh, the synchronicities that happen. Um, my good friend, uh, Paola Leopizzi Harris from Rome, she brought me on a story. You may have just heard Charles Hall talking. Uh, another fascinating story. So I got involved with Charles Hall, um, interviewed him in his home. And uh, I'm not sure what else I can add. Uh, if, later on, if there's questions on Saturday, on Sunday, there's going to be a, uh, a question answer period. And I would really like to field some questions to you um, and, and have you give me some feedback. Um, how many people are here just out of curiosity? Can I have a show of hands? Just curiosity? Okay, not too many people, two, twosies and threesies. How about uh, how many people are here because they've had an experience and they'd like to find others perhaps that have had those experiences? Okay, that's, that's a greater number. How many people are here because they love and they seek the truth? <laughs> All right, well that's great. Thanks so much and uh, I'd like to pass it on to Don. All right, Don Daniels is next. He is uh, also considered a disclosure witness. Well, actually, I wasn't on the witness panel at the uh, disclosure conference. I was helping staff the event. Can you hear me? Yeah, get it close. Uh, okay. So my mistake in there, Don, you, you're not actually in the, the witness list, but you were uh, in support of the project. I helped staff the event and uh, worked with Dr. Greer on that one. I have had um, uh, sightings of my own and I'm going to go over briefly the first one and because uh, that sets the scene for what happened to me at work. I can speak freely about what's happened to me as long as I don't associate my airline with these events and my name all at once. Uh, that's something that they could give me serious grief about still. Uh, I'm not saying. <laughs> uh, back in 1999, I went out on the first uh, uh, Seasetti expedition with Dr. Greer and uh, the very first night we had this thing come streaking in in the southwest looked like a meteor but not quite it was more of an energy streak than a point with a tail behind it caught my eye stopped instantly that really caught my eye and it was just instantly a big blue white point of light in the sky bigger and brighter than Venus uh, with a point of light in the sky it's almost impossible to judge the distance it, we're guessing anywhere from 2 to 20 miles away somewhere out there over the valley. Well, Dr. Greer took his laser pointer, he went flash, flash, and it went flash, flash. So I said, cool. <laughs> Somebody else picked up a um, main candle power spotlight, did the same thing, it flashed back. Now, being a pilot, I knew what this meant. We do this at night, sometimes we'll see another airplane, we flash our landing light, they flash back. It's kind of a basic, rudimentary, nonverbal communication. We're saying, hi, I see you, they say, I see you, you know, basically. We know that they're watching us, we're watching them, we're not gonna run into each other. Um, you know, basically we just said hi, they said hi back, I said, it's pretty cool. So the next thing that happened was this spotlight came down out of the craft, there were 18 of us there that night, like about a 30 foot diameter circle right on our group, scan line goes through and then the beam sucked back into the craft, it got shorter. It didn't just shut off like a light beam, it got shorter, weirdest effect. I said, cool, we've just been scanned. Well, you know, something like that happens, it's pretty exciting. So, my personality type, I can't hold that kind of thing inside. I tended to share it with some of the people I was flying with. And I found that the vast majority were quite interested. And once I broached the subject, a lot of them then opened up with experiences they'd had. And I found that I didn't keep good statistics, but it, somewhere between 30 and 40% of the pilots that I was flying with had had some kind of a UFO sighting, 30 to 40 percent. And these were the ones that would admit it to me. You know, of course, I'd broached the subject to start with, but uh, a lot of them had had close, you know, like less than 500 feet structured craft where they could see details, uh, rivets, windows, whatever. Well, most of them don't have rivets, but you know, they could see st structural details even. And they were sharing all kinds of stories with me. There were probably a few that were former military officers that had been in the military under orders to report these kind of things. Um, and uh, somebody apparently did. Uh, 
But fast forward a couple of years to the National Press Club uh, presentation of this disclosure project, May 9, 2001. Stephen Bassett was helping with that one also. That's where I first met him. Um, I helped staff that event. Uh, June, mid-June of 2001, I was uh, asked to be uh, major domo for the kickoff of the Disclosure Project World Tour. Since we got shut down so effectively in the national media, we took the show on the road. I had to look up what major domo was. Basically, it's like a maitre d'. You kind of handle all the details. You find a venue, you line up everything, uh, introduce the video, introduce the Dr. Greer, etc. We had uh, at the, uh, it, it was ironic, it, the uh, place we found was the chemistry auditorium at CU Boulder, the same place where Dr. Condon had said there's nothing to it. We overstuffed this largest auditorium on campus. It's supposed to hold 508 people. We had probably 800 in the room. I'm glad the fire marshal didn't come by. We turned several hundred away that we physically could not get in the door. When we started the show, started the video, a classic man in black in the back of the room goes running over the projection booth. He's beating on the door saying, you can't show this movie, you can't. Well, we escorted him outside, told him to leave. Um, about two weeks later, I got a phone call from the chief pilot. And uh, he told me that I'd been removed from my next trip with pay, which is polite for grounded, and that I had to see the company doctor before I flew again. And I said, well, Boss, what's this about? You know, and I tried to get enough detail so I kind of knew what I had to defend myself against. I had a pretty good suspicion. Oh, this is part of it. I have a sense of humor, which some of the management don't. I have a little wallet card. It says official Starfleet identification. And, uh, and it cuts off right there on, in the wallet. But you pull it out, it says Star Trek, the next generation, the collector's edition. And on the back it says Columbia House video club or something to that effect. Well, I never joined the club, but I carried the card because it's so great. Well, I was showing that to a flight attendant one day that was a real Trekkie, and I kind of flippantly said that I was dual qualified. Um, somehow, you know, like that telegraph game where you start a word around the room, it only took a couple of people to get totally distorted. It got back to the company that I believed I was qualified to fly spacecraft, and I had a wallet card to prove it. <laughs> I'm serious. Well, I, uh, I also suspected that they might be asking me about the, uh, the blue light special. And so I got some letters from some of the other scientists that were in the group. We had a professor of uh, Earth, Earth, Space, and Oceans from the University of New Hampshire, that's our science advisor, that was there. We had a biologist from California. Um, I started pulling in my resources real quick. The pilot union kind of like, uh, they didn't want to get too involved in this. It was kind of like, good luck. Um, I checked with a lawyer and he never returned my call. Um, so I kind of went into this thing all by myself and uh, talked to the company doctor. I showed him the wallet card and he laughed. And he says, well, it says Star Trek right on it. I said, yeah. And uh, he asked me a couple other things like, uh, what would I do if I saw a UFO flying towards me? And, and I, based on some of uh, Commander Bethune's experiences and some of the uh, uh, research by Dr. Haynes, where most of the injuries have occurred by people maneuvering too violently when there doesn't appear to be a collision hazard. They seem to be very, very proficient pilots, and they seem to know we're there. Doesn't even seem to be any turbulence behind them, so there didn't seem to be a problem. Uh, I basically said, well, I, I'd... Uh, you know, minimal maneuvering, and if I had time, I'd flash the light at them, and, and especially if they flashed back, I'd know they saw me and it was no threat. Well, somehow it got back around that I was teaching UFO collision avoidance maneuvers. Um, I'm, I'm serious. Um, well, anyway, we talked about a few things like that, and he decided that there was no need to send me to a full-fledged psychiatrist that I was saying and everything. And, He's starting to sign the letter, and he says, oh, by the way, what's this about this blue spotlight? And I said, oh, boy, here we go. I said, well, sir, you know, that event actually happened, and here's letters from a couple of the other scientists that were in the group that, that witnessed it, and uh, the illogical thing to do would be to deny it. And he looks at the letters, and he looks at me, and he says, well, can't argue with that. Finished signing the letter and sent me up to the chief pilot's office. So I walked up there, and I threw the letter down on the table. I threw my card down on the table, and... and 
He looks at that and he says, well, I'm glad it was something like that. And I said, boss, why didn't you just ask me my side of this ridiculous story before it got so out of control? And he says, sorry. Well, in that moment, I realized that I had the upper hand for just a moment. And uh, I said, well, does this mean that now I can, can talk about this subject with other pilots? And uh, he kind of says, well, try and be a little more aware of your audience, but yeah, you can talk about it. In that moment, that's probably historic, I have official airline management permission to talk about UFOs on the job. I've got a new chief pilot now, but I haven't asked the question again. <laughs> don't want to know, don't ask. You know, I'm, I'm still going on the original authority. Uh, I pushed my luck a little further at that point. I had, been, I had worked with Dr. Haynes to develop a survey for airline pilots which I had not been able to get approved for, for my company, he did manage to get it done at his company and they got some amazing results. I asked if he could try again to get approval for the study. That, that particular part of the request went nowhere, but uh, basically um, that's, that's the uh, condensed Reader's Digest version of the story. Uh, there's a lot more that I've experienced over the years and if you're catch me in the halls or at the question answer session. I'll be glad to uh, go on for hours. Thank you, Don. Appreciate it. And finally, <laughs> a gentleman I think is pretty well known to most of the people uh, in the research field and I think a lot of the audience, Jim Curran. Uh, thanks for coming. I, I'll try to be brief since I know we're running short on time. And I usually charge 150 an hour for research consultation. <laughs> and I know Steve's not going to pay it, so. <laughs> uh, so true. My, my study started, I started flying lessons when I was 10 years old, so I was always in the library studying flying books. And a flying book fell on the... Uh, ground from the library when I reached up for a different one and I thought it was a flying book and it turns out it was uh, Flying Saucers from Outer Space by uh, Major Kehoe. And I thought it was science fiction, started reading through it and took it home and found out it was based on uh, very professional people seeing strange things. And then I found out that uh, Major Kehoe was, uh, the first book he'd ever written was, was on his uh, you know, personal experiences with Charles Lindbergh. He was the, the main emissary with Charles Lindbergh and they were very close friends for, for years. So that gave some more credibility to uh, Major Kehoe and then he formed the National Investigation Committee on Aerial Phenomena, which uh, in the 60s I became a, a member and then when I turned 17 and got my flight instructor license, they let me be a field investigator for a while out in California and we saw some some unusual uh, cases out there that really started uh, solidifying uh, that there was something going on in my mind. And then, then things kind of simmered down once I, I got finally, uh, I taught a disc jockey how to fly and he got me in the radio business and I was doing news for a while and crazy radio shows and then I, I got on with a, the world's largest uh, freight carrier flying Tiger Airlines and flew for them for uh, almost seven years around the world every month. And we saw some, uh, I didn't see any cases there, but I, I met with people that, that did some of our pilots that had strange experiences. And it was only until um, starting in Christmas of, of 1989 that, that some unusual things took place that night. Uh, met some very unique individuals, and from there, my research uh, and connections started getting uh, real deep. And I had a similar experience as Don, where uh, if one pilot turns you in for talking about this subject, they just usually, uh, if not all the time, take it as a personality problem. But if two pilots turn in another pilot, then they take it pretty seriously, and they, it can get pretty ugly but especially on an unusual subject like this. And so um, uh, I got four days of, 
of uh, testing with the uh, one day with the FAA and four days with the uh, chief pilot. And he just, you know, it was, it was a surprise uh, line check type thing. And if they said, if you don't get through, you're going to be in a heap of trouble. And I, you know, I, I, I found out later what it was all about. I had a, it didn't take much to figure out some, somebody had said something that I talked about in the cockpit. And, you know, I learned to use discernment since then, but on the other hand, I was so furious that my freedom of speech rights had been uh, jeopardized, not, and plus my career, that uh, after it was all said and done, and we got, I got through all that and got signed off that, yeah, he's, he's of sane mind and, and can fly a plane. And it was also in the dead of winter with a blizzard going on, so he, even the FAA was actually uh, backed off on me. But at that point, um, I was doing some consulting for a TV show called Unsolved Mysteries, and we were doing segments on, on UFOs. And, and so I got, I got a call that uh, had been about a week and a half after all this was said and done, and got offered to do a live show five days a week on the UFO subject. And the person I did the show with would, had worked in government projects for many years uh, with very high levels of uh, top secret clearances. And the manager of the station said, as long as you uh, just put out whatever you want, uh, the lawyers have not, there's gonna be no censorship. Uh, we'll, we'll never cut you off and just speak your truth. So uh, I felt I had the green light since I'd already been through all the ordeal. And, and I was figured that was one way to get out the information of all the research uh, that I'd found out. So we did, uh, we were on the air five days a week for two and a half years, did about 534 shows live. And on 80% of it was on the UFO uh, situation. The rest was was on some uh, other unique unique subjects. And never had uh, since then. That was uh, the last show was over in 1994, and haven't had any problems since. In fact, the chief pilots sometimes uh, have called me in, wanting to see videos and talk about the subject. They've they've really gotten an interest. So it's kind of opening up, and, and I think the, uh, the show X-Files, which uh, became the most popular months. show in the world for a while with a billion people uh, a year, I uh, mean, a, a week seeing it with the syndication and such, and many, many shows kind of on the uh, History Channel, Discovery Channel, Learning Channel, channel have really broken the ice, making it much easier for uh, people like us to uh, talk about the subject more open. And you can't live in fear anyway. It's, it, it gets old real quick. But I was very fortunate to uh, have the time and the, and the ability to travel all over the world. I've gone to every remote location imaginable, met some of the uh, most unique people in not just the intelligence fields for other com uh, countries, but many, many uh, very unique people. And let's just say I got my proof, and it's been fascinating. Thank you. Thanks, Jim. Um, I'm going to, because of the time issues, I'm, I'm going to do the questioning here. And, and they are going to do another panel in track two, which will be in the B ballroom. And, and uh, a much better opportunity for you to ask questions uh, at that point. So you may want to attend that if you, if you can. Uh, but real quickly, let's, let's start off with something real basic. I'm going to start with Graham real, real quick. Graham. Uh, how, how, uh, how, many, how many flight hours did you log, and uh, what was your highest rank? Over 10,000. But you have to realize in the mil military you fly a desk along with us, and you have a lot so, of other jobs. 10,000 military at miles, yeah. Okay. Uh, Bob? Highest rank, and how many logged hours? Uh, highest rank in the airline, uh, captain. And uh, ours, I can only estimate, I think, uh, something like 12,000 because uh, I stopped keeping a logbook okay. a long time ago. David? In the military, um, only about 400 hours a year. I was in for seven years, so you can do the math. Um, that was helicopter time, and now I have, I guess, uh, 11,000 plus hours uh, with the airlines mm -hmm. and uh, currently a captain. Okay. Don? Well, I've got somewhere over 20,000 hours. I don't uh, total it up every month. Uh, 
flown just about everything Boeing makes except the 747 so far and uh, seven and a half years as captain. I've mm -hmm. um, been flying since, uh, well, many years, <laughs> since 1961. I have almost 28,000 hours. And uh, current, I've been a captain for uh, 23 years with a major carrier flying heavy jets. And before that, I was flying for other airlines as a first officer on heavy jets. I've flown many different oddball craft, <laughs> and it's been fun. 70, about 73,000 flight hours, uh, military service on three, and uh, captain virtually in every case. Um, I'll then just think back. Think back just 10 or 15 or 20 years, and think how people who discussed this subject were categorized. Think how they were labeled. Think how they were treated. Right? Many of those people had just as valid experience as these gentlemen. But they didn't have the training. And they didn't have, perhaps, the gravitas. But what we learned is there's no amount of gravitas, as John Mack learned very well. There is no amount of gravitas that exempts you from the policy of the government embedded in the truth embargo of this level. Question. Um, you know, pilots have had a rough time in many, many ways over the last 30 or 40 years. They have been, well, essentially, they've, they've seen their pay dramatically cut. They've lost pensions. Uh, they've been in a highly unstable industry. Some have done well, of course, right? Uh, we've got at least three or four airlines in bankruptcy. Even some of you could be out of a job very soon. Uh, and then on top of that, uh, you're knowingly put in a position where you're simply not allowed to discuss extraordinary events that happen to you. Even, even, even though those events clearly could have safety issues with your craft, with your, with your, uh, with your passengers. What's been the, how, have, how has the morale of pilots held up through all of this? Is this, is this helping to contribute to a, what we'll call a sea of pilot dissatisfaction in which the people that are flying these planes don't feel they're respected and, uh, and uh, it's, it's a little harder to get up in, in the morning and do your job. Do you have any thoughts about that? Who would like to step forward on that? Does this one work? One, two, three? Yeah, they're both work. A quick comment from me, then anybody can add to it. Um, I think it's uh, indicative of what's going on in the economy in the world today. It's just being reflected in the aviation industry, uh, the same as any other industry. Um, I personally don't feel um, hard done by at all. I'm very happy. I feel there's a higher power governing at all. So where one door closes, another one opens. So, um, but from a, a purely nuts and bolts side of things, yes, there are some people who feel hard done by. Um, some of them are very heavy or strong union types. Industrial action, they think, is the way to go. Um, however, you can't fight the pot of gold that's only so big. So. Um, it, but, but as far as credibility, Steve, is, is it, are you asking about the U, how it responds to the how, how it uh, applies to the UFO issue and, and the pilots and how they're? Well, but yeah, it, 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 I'm, I'm trying to imagine being a fairly skilled person with a high level of responsibility for life and death, knowing that they simply cannot approach certain issues. They're not allowed to talk about it. They could be hurt by it, whether it's true or not, and that the issues involved are not simply I irrelevant. They are, in fact, directly surrounding their work, right? Near misses, uh, uh, sightings, distractions, all these things. The issue of airline safety, which is, of course, what NARCAP is doing and how they're trying to morph the issue into that, which I, I think is not a wise move. But still, if I'm a person in that job, and I, I'm not, but I, I'm trying to guess, I, I'm, not, I'm not happy about that. And it's a day-in, day-out thing. Every day, you're, you know that that's the way it is. I, I see someone in that position as a second-class citizen. Anyone care to comment on that? Well, well as far as uh, UFOs are concerned, um, until it becomes less of a fringe subject and, and people accept it more, um, they're not going to address it and they're going to try and, and, and bury it. Um, a classic example is a, a chief pilot of mine in New Zealand. Uh, in 1978, Dr. Bruce McAbee was also involved in the investigation of this, of this uh, event. He has a comment um, that if you can bring it up on the screen there, Steve, this may answer your question as far as um, feeling persecuted or, or, or uncomfortable about uh, talking about these things because of the position he's in. 
We're gonna give it a try. Okay, uh, let's throw that on. I'm not sure if it's gonna fly, but let's see. Well, it was it was a minute ago. Uh, at least it picked it up, and uh, yeah, I've got a I've got a troublesome hard drive here, David. I think we're gonna we're gonna miss out on this. So okay, okay. Well, uh, perhaps in the perhaps in the workshop. Oh wait, we'll get him. Oh, happening. okay. Hang on, hang on. Got sound? I have a very finicky machine. It's Windows. Cannot play. Yeah. It's it's not good to say crash. Can you hit pilot's panel? <laughs> Just, just try hitting play down the bottom with this. I'll David. try. I think, it, I think, I think we're out of luck part of it. Let it's me, let a me good try thing again. our airliners don't operate on the Windows operating system. Yeah. No, we're not, we we're not, we're not going to get that. computers in my airplane. I don't think we're not going to uh, get it. We'll, 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 there'll be a different computer in your workshop, and we may be able to pull that up. And, and okay, I understand. Okay. But the, look. Well, I'd like to pass on to somebody else. Yeah, does anybody else want to comment on this? This, this concept of being a second-class citizen. Well, both. Uh, working with the disclosure project and interviewing witnesses and talking with uh, co-pilots and stuff over the over the years I have found that when these people are able to finally talk to somebody that's receptive about the the subject and doesn't just ridicule them right off the bat it's like a ton of weight coming off their shoulders one one example was a uh, he's a retired 747 captain and before that when he was in the military he had a uh, close pacing incident a cigar shaped craft that paced his uh, bomber when they first started carrying nukes for um, five or six minutes and they'd maneuver it maneuver uh, It popped over the other side. It was just matching everything he did and he said he didn't feel threatened by it or anything He thought it was kind of cool. They were playing with him as much as he was playing with them, but the uh, the first few people in his bomber wing that that reported these things like they were supposed to they gave him paperwork to fill out. It was like 80 pages. The first two or three pages were what happened. The remainder was a psychological profile on the pilot, his wife, his parents, his whole family, so that they could then trash him. He said those guys' careers went flatline. They never could get a promotion. Pretty quick, they realized that you just don't report these things. That was probably the intent all along, was to discourage reporting by making an example of the first few. So these people are carrying this inside them their whole career. Then he was flying for the airline. Then he finally retired. He saw the Disclosure Project uh, video, and he says, ah, somebody I can talk to. And he came and talked to us. And he said it was like a ton of weight coming off his shoulders. It was He could finally speak his truth, and it was just, huh. So the emotional damage that is done, especially to pilots, by the disinformation ridicule uh, campaign to silence the issue, is, is absolutely devastating to more people than you can imagine. And it's time for that to end. Okay. Let's talk about from the military point of view, all right? We have, if, if, you, if, you were, if your job is to protect and defend the United States and you, you know, either implicitly or explicitly, that if you have experiences in this area, which clearly have national security consequences, you're not allowed to talk about it. Or it could grave, grave consequences, right? Meaning we must be silent there, or sometimes they will, they will I understand they will, they will take a case and interview it and run the person through the mill just to sort of send a message to others. So you have person, a patriot that is, is defending the country, uh, by taking risks, and they're not allowed to talk about something which has poses a national security threat. You now have them in a completely conflicted position. All right. Any other area, okay, if they had information that was clearly a national security risk and they didn't bring it forward, they could be they could be court-martialed. But in this area, they're court-martialed if they bring it forward. Now you've got whole segments of a military, high-end military, in conflicted positions. Is, is that? Graham, do you, do you, is that a reasonable interpretation, and is that the proper way to deal with our military defenders? Well, when they brought up national security to us, we just accepted it, that it was something that was going to affect national security, and uh, we didn't talk about it. In the case of our encounter, uh, no one talked about it. I was called into the wing commander's office, and 
explained the encounter and he said to me, fortunately I was not threatened. He said, this is something you don't talk about, not even to your wife. So, and, and of course, at the time that I retired, uh, Major Kehoe had contacted me and Admiral Hugh and Cutter was gonna go before Congress too, so they were gonna give us some kind of immunity. So, w once that happened, and of course now I don't have a job like these gentlemen, I'm retired. And so I feel that, uh, that my report is that uh, I got out of the archives and uh, it, so they accidentally hid it and they didn't know where they hid it. And so it was declassified in some cases under the Freedom of Information Act. And then uh, Timothy Good got a, a copy from the Navy. They didn't release it till 1985 and that was an executive order, just my report, that was it. So yes, anytime that uh, they brought up something like that, they pretty much had you. <laughs> Um, if nobody else wants to comment, I'll go to another question. A number of years ago, there was a very famous case, not case, I guess, sort of an event, uh, in which a, a, a very a senior Japanese airline captain uh, saw something and came back and reported it, um, probably feeling that with all that seniority, he was okay. And he got, I think, essentially cashiered definitely seriously affected, I and mean, he wasn't flying. And then a sort of a backlash developed. It was kind of a, you know, some sort of a campaign, a writing campaign, a popular campaign, and he was reinstated to fly again. You, rec you recall this case? Does anybody remember this? Okay, does someone have something they might want to add about that? It, it's been a while, but I remember it still. He, he was uh, fired, and he took him a while to get his job back. But uh, the, the case is, uh, Interesting because the, at the time I was in, uh, with with this cargo carrier, and that was one of our routes. And I wasn't on the the flight, but it happened the, the same month, and it never got in the papers. And the one of I just happened to find out about it because a friend of mine was the uh, flight engineer on the on the trip. But it was one of our 747s, which is the same as what the JAL captain was flying, and the. I was talking to my friend in the, the crew room, and he says, I gotta tell you something. And I, and I said, what's up? And he didn't even know I was into this research. And he said, man, I just had a trip back uh, to uh, Tokyo, and you won't believe what happened. I'm sworn to secrecy, but uh, you know, you're about the only guy, you know, we were pretty close. I could, and he said, I brought the only guy I, could, I feel I can talk to. So, uh, it, long story short, uh, a craft, he described about the size of an aircraft carrier, made the 7-4 look like a tinker toy, came up alongside, flew in formation for, he said roughly about four minutes, and then it took off in front of him, came back around, and they, I mean, they saw, he saw two rows of windows, the whole enchilada. Uh, they didn't have any of their flight instruments or anything go wacky like a lot of them do with some kind of electromagnetic effect, but. Uh, when they they got to uh, Tokyo and landed, they were told to, because they had reported the incident, and they were pretty shook up, and they were, they were diverted off to a secured area, and some kind of intelligence people, I don't know who, they went in and got all debriefed, told never to talk about it, and then they, you know, at this, the same period of time here, this JAL captain does go public, and, you know, he got crucified. So I, I know that case pretty well. It's, it's mm -hmm. sad what happened to him. One last question. Then we have a cocktail party for those who have tickets to attend. Um, it also occurs that you'll, be, uh, you'll have a situation where you have a plane in flight and the passengers on the plane, commercial flight, see something extraordinary. Possibly the pilots don't, possibly they do. Uh, now this is a little different situation. Do you have some sense who, who, who has, how, do, how is that handled when you have that circumstance? Where you have a circumstance, maybe the pilot sees something, and you've got eight or nine people on the plane that are all, you know, talking excited and everything, and the stewardess, that they've seen something. What typically is going to happen under that circumstance? Who has a handle on that? Well, I've never had that happen. Um, I would encourage everybody to, uh, you know, it's a Kodak moment, get your cameras out and uh, uh, 
and then scatter the evidence to the four winds to uh, every organization you can think of and, and, uh, and, and make it to where they can't cover it up. But uh, that's just me. I'm a little bit out there. Uh, I do have an incident. I've got some uh, data link communications from an airline. Uh, and uh, let me just read this. It came to, my, uh, came to me anonymously. But, uh, and I was not flying that day, but uh, there was a message from the dispatch that said there's an unidentified object flying over the U.S. Turn off Channel 9, which is the uh, communications, uh, air traffic control communications to the, p to the passenger headsets. Uh, follow away all ATC instructions. I'll let you know when I have more info. Operate the flight as normal. That was the first message. The second one says... And I quote, yeah, atmospheric event is over, sure military is standing down. They don't have to give it to you. So we are still in the dark, but there is no security problems. You can operate Channel 9 if you wish for the passengers. We now resume normal programming. Regards in the dispatcher's name. Uh, third message, uh, apparently, you know, I, this does not print out the message that they sent from the airplane to the dispatch. So apparently they ask a question and it said, uh, uh, it's some NORAD issue, really have no other info now, but all, area, uh, all areas, I'm not sure what that means, regards. And then uh, the next day, apparently the crew had asked the dispatcher if they had any more info, and the message came back, uh, said nothing made it into the press. NORAD told us that it was an atmospheric event, but that's it. We'll find out what really happened in 10 years when they tell us who killed JFK. <laughs> and the dispatcher's name. Uh, I have it right here. Um, Thanks, gentlemen. So, for an airline that has no official policy on the subject, for them to go out and tell every air this went out to every airplane that was airborne in the U.S. at the time uh, that you know turn off the air traffic control communications so the passengers don't overhear anything. I thought that was rather astounding. Very interesting. Very interesting. All right, we're going to close out here. Um, again, they're going to be uh, appearing in the. Uh, Track two lectures, I forget, I think it's Friday? I mean Sunday, rather, on Sunday? Okay. It's been a long day. Uh, I want to leave you with this thought. Um, and it's, again, one of the reasons why I did this. I may do more of it. I think that the truth embargo, if you look at it systemically, has about six or seven major fault lines, and then it has a lot of weak areas, okay? It's like a really bad dam, you know, in Southern California, right? And it could go at any minute. It doesn't have to completely collapse at once. It just needs one break. And I've talked at various times about a number of the areas where it could go. Right? This is one of the reasons why I was saying as early as 1997 on the Art Bell Show that I thought it could happen at any moment. Of course, that was based on some things going on in the Clinton administration. Drove Bar Art nuts, you know, <laughs> because it didn't happen. I would predict, I thought, and predicted, but I said it could very well happen. Didn't have to get him, make him mad. Of course, you know, he had some people coming on and predicting some pretty crazy things. It didn't seem to bother him much, but this bothered him somehow. Um, here's my thinking. I believe there are somewhere between 10 and 25,000 pilots currently living and or active who have seen significant events. I believe if just 500 pilots came forward simultaneously, spoke to the news media and said, enough is enough, I'm tired of being treated like a child, I want to I I speak my mind, and said what they had saw, a number of them would be full out discs, hovering over cockpits, off wings, and so forth. That the cover up would collapse within 72 hours. But in order for them to do that, they have to walk through the ridicule curtain, which exists only up here, though it does have consequences in some cases, particularly in those kinds of cases. For many people, it's just a curtain. There's no consequence, but they won't cross it. For pilots, a little different. But there are so many retired now that I think you could get as many as 300 retired pilots. 300 pilots ends the truth embargo, 57 years old, and starts the new paradigm, 72 hours. That's how vulnerable it is. And there are many other vulnerabilities of that level. I'm really pleased these gentlemen have gone to great trouble to come here. Uh, and uh, I, I hope that uh, you'll enjoy maybe uh, spending some more time with them. You're going to be at the tables, of course. Uh, this is some of the most interesting stuff going. Let's give them a great hand and go have some hors d'oeuvres. Thank you. Thanks, guys. Appreciate it.